So, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second part of this event uh, on uh, silence. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Le Breton, who is Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Strasbourg. He is a member of European Dynamics and of the Institut, uh, Institut Universitaire de France. His research focuses mostly on the representations of the human body and the analysis of risk behavior, but he has also worked and written about topics such as uh, pain and silence. And indeed, he's the author of uh, Du Silence, uh, a work published in 2015 and of a recent publication for Bloomsbury in 2017 uh, entitled Sensing the World, an Anthropology of the Senses. And without further ado, I'll just shut up, um, mute myself and stop the video and leave the floor to Professor Le Breton. So thank you very much again for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Domenico. Thank you for your translation of my text and for your, your trust. Thank you, uh, Flaminia. Thank you, Lea. I am very sorry for my bad English and my bad uh, pron pronunciation. It will, in it will introduce you to an involuntary note of humor and exotism. I am sorry of that. Silence is a feeling, a modality of meaning rather than simply being the measure of the surrounding soundscape. It relates back to the individual's attitude towards the environment. Silence makes next social imaginaries betray their ambivalence. First, with silence, some experience a feeling of contemplative reflection and tranquil happiness, while others are frightened by and look at noise or speech as remedies against such fear. In this respect, and Rudolf Otto cites it as an example, in this respect, silence participates in the dialectic of the sacred an ambiguous blend of angst and attraction, terror and glee, capable of reassuring and unsettling according to the circumstances. Silence is a form that cannot be illustrated univocally, once and for all. But the deliberate profusion of noise is certainly a different mechanism as the diffusion of ambient music in most public place attests. At that time, that noise is increasingly perceived as a violation of the individual right to a convenient acoustic comfort and is accordingly construed as a nuisance. Further, sociologists have rightly seen in the widespread popularity of works and acts a manifestation of the quest for a silent dimension. Silence presents itself in a multiplicity of figures that deserve reflection. It is a space for inwardness, and as such, it represents a perfect way to escape from the social constraints of everyday life. A descent into the self attempted not out of solipsism, but to retrieve an element of universality in oneself. It is also a form of contemplative reflection that, that lets multiple surrounding significations float around in order to grant access to other layers of reality while being liberated from the constraints of meanings which are permanently bound to. Silence is also a form of contemplation a tribute to the beauty of the world, a willingness to provisionally break away from oral speech and devote ourselves wholly to a feeling of bliss and connection with the world. Being silent together is indeed the privilege of lovers and friends, friends of those who put trust in each other. Speech is unnecessary in our faces are in if our faces are in agreement. Walking is another case in point as it is an activity which elicits silence directly. A walker moves away from the surrounding noise to find a form of perambulating spirituality, a pacified dimension. Space doesn't simply consist of what is seen 
but also what is heard, what is across the senses. A space dominated by silence introduces a particular dimension into the world. The search for silence reflects a desire of quiet reflection and immersion in a favorable space, where, is it, where it is possible to take a breath, recover and reflect in a soothing quiet. Silence insinuates its own dimension into the world almost as a, as a sickness that embraces all, all things. Time passes without haste at walking paths, calling for rest, meditation, and loitering. Places enriched with silence stand out from the surrounding landscape as suitable space, as suitable spaces for reinitiating re with the self, reinitiating with the self, where one can make provision of interiority as it were before turning back to city life or everyday existence. Silence then stimulates an acute feeling of existence in so far as it marks a moment of ascetic starkness in which the individual may find its bearings, regain its, its interior unity, or take the step toward a difficult decision. Some places <coughs> forbid the utterance of unfamiliar sounds or talkative speech as they rest on such a fragile balance that human intervention on them is limited to contemplation. Silence penetrates so deeply in forests, deserts, mountains, or seas that the world and the other senses become obsolete. Speech is voiceless, unable to express the power of the moment and the solemnity of the place. Describing a walk um, with a friend through a forest on Mount Athos, the, the, the Greek uh, writer Nikos Kazantzaki wrote, I, I quote it, it, seems, it seemed as if we had entered an immense church. The sea, the chestnut trees, the mountains towering, towering like domes above us, the open sky, I turned to my friend. Why are we speaking? I said in the attempt, why, why are we not speaking? I said in the attempt to break the silence that was, that was starting to make me feel uncomfortable. We are speaking, he replied, putting his hand on my shoulder. We are speaking the language of the angels, silence. Then, all of a sudden, almost in anger, he said, what do you want to say? That, is, that it is beautiful, that our earth has wings and would like to fly away, that we took the path that leads to paradise. Words, words, shut up. End of the quotation. Speech reinstates the separation that it aims to ward off without ever fully achieving its aim. Contemplative reflection clashes with speech as the latter dissipates the former because of the attention it calls for itself. Dialogue is then a violent separation from the landscape, a nod to societal norms and conventions to reassure oneself and abandon a state of amassed isolation. Emotions get lost in the very act um, intended to utter them. The feeling of connection with the cosmos and dissolution of all boundaries falls within an intimate form of the sacred, which lies at the mercy of the slightest chatter. Silence enables the solemnity of places to overcome individuals, making them resonate with the quivering of the environment it restores the feeling of being present in the world. Walking is a journey through silence, 
and the pleasures of soundscape. Sounds flow through, through silence without disturbing its order. Silence resonates as a signature of a place, an almost tangible substance whose presence haunts space and constantly attracts attention. Walking through the ruins of Gemilla, Albert Camus observed, I quote him, observed a heavy and impenetrable silence, something like a perfectly balanced scale. Birds cry, the muffled sound of a three-hole flute, the trampling of goats, murmurs coming from the sky, such was the sound that composed, that composed the silence and the desolation of these places. End of the quotation. In his book, Desert Solitaire, the, the American writer Edward Abbey recalls his walk towards the Rainbow Bridge, an, an almost inaccessible place located in a natural, natural park in Utah. Exhausted, he rested briefly under the shadow of, a, of an overhanging cornice and drank from his canteen. In this very moment, he started listening to the stillness of the canyon, a silence that no gust of wind, no movement, no birds, cry could break, could break not even the regular sound of water he had followed for a long time. These this are his words, I quote him. Alone in the silence, I understand for a moment the dread which many feel in the presence of prim primeval desert, the unconscious fear which compels them to tam, alter, or destroy what they cannot understand, to reduce the wild and pre-human to human dimensions, anything rather than confront directly the anti-human, that other world which frightens not through danger or hostility, but in something far worse, its implacable indifference. End of quotation. Our relationship with silence is a test that reveals socio-cultural socio as well as personal attitudes. While, while I have so far presented it at, as pleasant contemplation, especially for walkers, silence also gives rise to a different form of the sacred, namely angst. In such cases, it is perceived as a deprivation of the safe benchmarks on which our relationship with the objects and the other, the others is based. Thus, silence confronts individuals with the concrete, concreteness of facts as they discover how far things ultimately um, delude them and how far the meaning that makes the word familiar is a convention, a necessary one, but one so fragile that any little thing can disaggregate, can disaggregate it. Some react with fear to a world light bar like that, where the sound traces protected their peace of mind suddenly disappeared. Indeed, such people see noise, see noise as a clause of meaning, as it were, in that it protects them from the brutality of the world and shields them against the emptiness that silence may involve. Indeed, the event is made possible by the intrusion of, the, of its noise, cutting into silence, which instead conveys the feeling of a flat expanse, flawless and without history, filled at the same time with security and angst, thanks to its polysemy and its lack, lack, of, lack of boundaries. And what about silence in religions? Speaking in very broad terms, 
One might, might claim that silence is a language of God. Speech divides the world and introduces the fracture and the connection, of course, of meaning. Yet, for the believer, particularly in mono monotheistic religions or in oriental spiritualities, God cannot be reduced to a limited signification. He escapes speech because he is beyond what, beyond any boundaries of meaning. Speech and fashion features are antithetical, antithetical to divine attributes as they pertain to a self of essentially human features in that they are evidence of a separation. God is faceless because he represents the infinity of possible faces. Likewise, no speech can exhaust the variety of human addresses to him, whether it be to speak to him or to name it, him, to name him. Silence is laden with far more meanings than language. For the believer, and even more for the mystic, God is beyond words and soft. He is not on by he is not on par with human beings, and all speech about him reduces him to a human dimension. While it is a true, while while it is true that monotheistic religions have never renounced to, to the authority of the spoken word or to singing, a certain predilection of silence emerges from their respective theologies. Even the most fervent believers cannot free themselves from their human condition to bear whiteness of their face. Thus, language proves as often necessary to speak the impossibility to speak as in the case of mystics. Soft speech turns out to be necessary. The address to God is often embroidered, em, embroidered there, pardon, embroidered with a distinct tonality of silence. Fast with God's immensity, a, a hymn of silence sprouts up in the mouth of the zealous believer, according to the famous passage attributed to Gregory of Nacianzus. Further, in line with the Jewish tradition, André Neher claims that, I quote him, just like silence represents the most eloquent form of, of revelation, so the most eloquent instrument of worship is silence. And André Neher goes on by quoting Psalm 62, only in God is my being quiet, and Psalm 65, to you, silence is praise. Islamic mysticism is no exception, as shown by Rumi when, she, when he says, keep silence in order to hear what God inspires you. The believer's retreat toward interiority makes the babbling of speech unnecessary. Silence is the language of God because it contains all words. It is an endless supply of meaning. Believers are invited to make silence and withdraw from the ordinary conditions of conversation to listen to a speech that the fault lines of words are unable to convey. Yet, only a complete devotion enables the believer to listen to divine, to divine speech. Thus, some believers address God by means of an inner speech apparently similar to silence and yet reflecting an active intention. The view that God doesn't need ears to listen to the believer's prayers tends to prevail. Hence, prayers and vows are expressed silently in the earth in the belief that they will eventually be fulfilled. God, I blaspheme if I've named if I name you, said Angela da Foligno, a mystic. Silence becomes then the most tactful manner to preserve the immensity of meaning. Mysticism 
relies on silence conceived as a widespread kind of speech, a relic of a language partly dissolved in the illumination and in the dazzled feeling evoked by the presence of God. Translating God into words leaves the essential out of the discourse without ultimately freeing the mystics from the human instruments that they keep using to name their feelings. Michel de Certeau, for example, rightly claims that, I quote him, the mystical phrase is an artifact of silence. It produces silence through the noise of words. End of quotation. Mystics are faced with the painful inadequacy that separates a language ingrained in their flesh and a god transcending all categories of sound. The fascination for silence and solitude in the inhospitable spaces of the Egyptian desert predates the early Christians. It makes its first appearance at the end of the second millennium. Indeed, the so-called graffiti of the Theban mountain attests a spiritual quest fundamentally expressed through an attraction for isolation. The practice of inner prayer achieved without uttering a single word characterizes these solitary desert dwellers as well as humility and a quest for salvation. Christian monasticism was born in the fourth century in the Egyptian desert. As the church, rich and privileged, under imperial protection, was celebrating its, its triumph, this man chose to leave the world in order to preserve their faith and dedicate their life entirely to God in a rigorous atmosphere of penance. The external desert opens a path toward the inner desert, encouraging spiritual liberation through a rejection of the senses, while the desert doesn't teach anything in itself, it tests the faith insofar as it reveals the zeal that animates the hermit. The aspiration toward a, commun a community life centered on prayer, far from the world's temptations, lies at the heart of the monastic approach. In these isolated places, remote from ordinary social ties, speech is regulated and silence passes the life of the monks. Liturgy is the basis of the spiritual life of monasteries. The monk is above all a man who, pray, who prays and meditates according to given religious systems. Silence is rigidly imposed on the course of monastic life and speech is accurately confined to certain occasions. The monk keeps silent in, unless he is questioned and even if he speaks, he, doesn't, he does so with modesty since all excess verges on sin. Control of speech is one of the cardinal rules that novice Buddhist monks are reminded, uh, are reminded of as they enter the monastery. Control of the senses, retreat from the turbulence of the world. By a moderate use of speech, Buddhist monks submit themselves to the rule of silence that govern the organization of their monastery. In the East, Buddha's disciples popularized such spiritual retreat from society in solitude and silence. Being located in the transcendence of language, silence is beyond question and answer, and beyond every illusion. A disciple one once asked Buddha if he could speak the truth without uttering any word. By keeping silent, Buddha showed him that this was indeed possible. Oriental traditions document also a silent music, almost beyond sense, that invites 
contemplative meditation and encourages the pursuit of an inner journey. The sounds of silence perceived by the initiated open a spiritual road embodied in the world and yet remote from everyday customs. In, in, 40, in 1935, uh, the, 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 the great, the great uh, uh, writer Nikos Kazantzakis attended a concert that took place in a, in a temple in Beijing. Musicians sat down and started to focus after turning their instruments. Then the following happened. I quote Kazantzaki. The old master of the house sketches out a movement with his hands as if to clap, but his palms stopped just before they could touch. That is the signal that opens this astonishing silent concert. The violinists raise their bows and the flute players adjust their instruments on their lips while their fingers move rapidly on the old. Deep silence, nothing can be heard. It was as if the concert was taking place from afar among the shadows on the other side of life, and yet one could see the, mus the musicians play in an immovable silence. Deeply troubled, the writer noticed the solemn communion uniting the audience. I quote him again. They followed the musicians' movements and com completed them in themselves. The silent music was springing from their sounds. End of quotation. Once the concert was finished, Kezonzaki turned to his neighbor, who looked at him with a bright smile and said, I, I quote Kezonzaki, for the train here, sound is unnecessary. Freed souls do not need action. The true Buddha as nobody. End of quotation. The Eastern virtuoso touches the string of his instrument in silence. The sound that, it, that is emitted cannot be heard because it appeals to a kind of subtle hearing that requires special education and spiritual pur purity. A monk once asked Chu Chen to play his stringless harp, but confessed that he, could, that he could not hear anything. Chu Chen replied, why didn't you ask me to play louder? Some Hindu, sage, some Hindu sages are strong supporters of silence too. Maharsi, for, his, for instance, is known for his, for his insistence on silence as part of the process of self-edification. He claims that, I quote him, silence is in unbroken eloquence. It is a vocal emission that hinders the other voice, the voice of silence. Truth is revealed, is revealed in silence. Silence is the most powerful form of spiritual work. End of quotation. Jean Grenier, a philosopher and writer, a French a philosopher and writer, Jean Grenier experienced this in a meeting with a monk. The monk took a yogi position in India. The monk took the monk, the monk, oh, sorry. The monk took, took a yogi position. The audience was waiting for him to start speaking but he kept his mouth shut. Jean Grenier remarked that, I quote him, the Brahmin did not speak for several minutes. Then a quarter of an, of an hour passed and he was still silent. The more he was silent, the more he was listened to, he was listened to in a religious silence. Listened, yes, this is the word 
and everyone did indeed listen attentively to the word about to be heard. Everyone seemed to take part in this peaceful stillness and eventually everyone stopped waiting for anything. An hour passed in this way so that there was no more sense of past and future immersed as we were in a present that kept expanding without breaking. End of the quotation of Jean Grenier. Initiation through silence is frequent in India and its power is well known. Even if the guru wishes to deliver an oral message, the sobriety of his speech remains an essential feature. In the context of a spiritual initiation, if, if speech wishes to touch the other deeply enough, deeply enough to change their thoughts of their, or their relationship with the world and broaden their freedom, it must be loaded with silence. Silence removes, sh removes shutter and particularly the lack of signification. The withdrawal of the teacher is that moment when speech is a modulation of silence and silence a modulation of speech. If the teacher speaks, silence is there. If the teacher is silent, speech still radiates its rightness. Any question from the disciple feeds into another question from the teacher or rather into their mutism whose aim is to keep the tension of a research built over the experiences and the doubts of the disciple. If the teacher answers the question, he imposes his authority and prevents the disciple from testing the truth, a process which gives strength and validity to the learning path. When it exempts from this search, speech offers a moral reassurance that often turns out to be, in, in, to be counterproductive. Speech, come, speech become counterproductive. Indeed, such an approach pushes those who are afraid of freedom toward sex or religious integ integralisms. The novice themselves must find their own answers in silence and discern a direction in the path that they are the only ones to tread. The master doesn't possess the truth, then rather he transmits meaning. Fully aware that the individuality of any research path can never be crystallized in a dogma whose solution have already been carefully recorded. If the teacher claimed to state the truth, he would immobilize forever a process that must be pursued without respite. His teaching process has unquestionably more to do with what he does, what he, what he doesn't say that with his speech. On the contrary, the teacher of truth encourages laziness by simply stating what one should do and think. By doing so, he removes all anxiety and creates disciples rather than researchers. His discourse doesn't have space for silence since he is not interested in, law, in leading the disciple to independent thinking, but to the mere repetition of his own propositions. Thus, the disciples become his subordinate mirrors. The teacher of truth points to a single research path that turns the disciple into an inferior double ganger. An intense experience of the sacred can leave the individuals voiceless and speechless. It fills them with the entirely other and thus removes them from the, from the ordinary dimension that language usually accounts for. Each form of individual transcendence 
confront those who are eager to communicate it with a setback of language and encourage, encourages them to resort to silence. The inability to speak the experience of God is shared across different spiritualities, even if numerous differences prove that each one, each one of them maintains its, dis its distinctive orientation. Silence is a common background of religious experience. Religious life implements a particular discipline of silence in prayer and liturgy, as well as in the organization of monastic life. However, mystical experience varies strongly despite the shared resemblance adapting to the religious traditions to which it relates or rather providing them with a language in the Saussurian sense and a cultural form that also contributes to their shaping and formation. Just like every work of creation, mysticism inscribes itself in the, socio, in the socio-cultural coordinates that, gives, that give it its content and its means of expression. Also, if, also if it sometimes goes beyond customary manifestations of faith and indicates a path that nobody has yet trodden. For the believer, silence is the language of God because it contains all world. It is an inexhaustible supply of meaning. Thus, many believers address their God with inner speech, apparently equivalent to silence, self ultimately relying on an active intention. The widespread view that the God that God uh, doesn't need ears to listen to a believer, silently uttered in the believer's heart of earth, the prior finds its own way. I have finished. Uh, thank you very much for your 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 trust and your, uh, your your listening. And sorry very much for my bad English and, and bad accent. <coughs> Don't worry at all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Le Breton. That was a very fascinating uh, talk. Um, obviously, may I remind you that to ask questions, we um, you need to type question in the chat. Um, alternatively, well, also when we have the first question, the thing you can do is that you can type follow up if you want to ask something related to the last, the last question. So I have some questions, uh, but obviously I don't want to monopolize the attention. And if there's anyone who wants to ask anything to Professor Le Breton, uh, please do write question in the chat. If if there is no question, perhaps I can uh, kick off. I can try mm. to ask the question in French and then I can translate it. So Leah, I, I, I'll try. Um, so in English, my question would actually be about your methodology. So do you consider silence as a cross-cultural and sort of trans-historical experience with shared traits across time, space and cultures? Or do you see it as a culturally determined concept with specific features in each culture? And in a sense, I'm asking this because you made an example, well, a few examples, like for instance, Buddha uh, not um, replying uh, to the dis disciple or uh, silent prayer that would not work in a different culture, like Roman culture, for instance. And this is because there, in, in that particular uh, culture, silence is largely connoted as a deprivation rather than as an announcement of meaning, in a sense. So how? How do you reconcile cultural diversity in this sort of wide ranging anthropological, I would say phenomenological uh, interpretation of silence? And the same thing in French would be, um, if you want me to, I, I can translate. Je me demandais uh, si vous pouviez élucider davantage votre méthodologie qui, uh, qui me semble, corrigez-moi si je me trompe, uh, fondamentalement un phénoménologique. Um, Euh, ma question serait, euh, considérez-vous le silence comme une expérience euh, interculturelle ou, ou transhistorique avec des traits communs à travers le temps, euh, l'espace, les cultures, euh, ou les voyez-vous comme un concept culturellement déterminé euh, avec des caractéristiques spécifiques à chaque culture Et je pose cette question parce que 
L'exemple que vous avez donné à propos, de, à propos de Bouddha, par exemple, ne répondant pas à son disciple et, et ne fonctionnerait pas dans une culture différente comme la culture romaine, par mmh. exemple. Euh, là, un destinataire qui ne répond pas et reste en silence euh, est connoté comme inférieur à l'adresseur. Mmh. Euh, une prière silencieuse, euh, par exemple, serait également incompréhensible pour un ancien roman. Mm -hmm. euh, en effet, dans, dans la culture romaine, le silence est largement connoté comme on, euh, une privation plutôt qu'une euh, mm -hmm. qu euh, euh, augmentation du sang, euh, pour ainsi dire. Ma question pourrait donc être, être résumée comme, comme suit. Comment conciliez-vous la diversité culturelle dans votre interprétation anthropologique, phénoménologique du silence mm -hmm. Alors, I will, I will speak in, in, in French because it, it's too, it will be too, too compliqué to, to respond in English. Uh, pour moi, le, for, me, the, for me, silence is a question, not a response. It, it will be the same as concerns, for example, the body, the, the face, uh, the, the pain, uh, which, uh, donc des, des sujets que j'ai souvent abordés dans mon travail. Donc, le, pour moi, le silence, c'est une question de sens. Ce n'est pas une nature, ce n'est pas une évidence, c'est une signification. C'est uniquement une signification. Donc, le silence, entre guillemets, est toujours inséré dans un complexe social et culturel qui lui donne un sens et une valeur. I let you translate. OK. Um, so... Um, for Le Breton, silence is essentially about meaning or signification. Um, it's always inscribed in a kind of socio-cultural context, and that's really the key point here. Si vous vous arrêtez vraiment régulièrement pour que je puisse traduire tout ce que vous dites. Oh, oui, d'accord. Oui, donc, je, il faut ajouter quand même que pour moi, le silence est une question et en aucun cas une réponse. Okay, so silence is fundamentally a question and it's never a response. Il n'y a pas de nature du silence. There's no nature of silence. Mais uniquement des significations au, à, son, à, son, à son égard, à son, à son propos. So there's only a question of signification um, with regards to it. Je, je dirais que le, le silence, comme le corps, comme euh, le visage, par exemple, ce sont des manières de parler. Parce que les représentations du silence, du corps ou du visage, par exemple, sont extraordinairement différentes à, à travers le monde. Ok, so there's a kind of comparison between silence and the body. Um, le visage, vous avez dit? Oui, oui par exemple. And, and one's face. Um, and, allez-y, continuez s'il vous plaît. Euh, oui, ce sont des matières de sens et, et pas des natures, pas des objets. Ok, so they're not natures, they're not objects. It's all about um, questions of meaning, sense. Voilà. voilà. If I can briefly elaborate on this and ask a very quick follow-up question. Uh, I mean, my, my question was more about, has more to, had more to do with how do you reconstruct, you know, this, even this question and this mm -hmm. meaning. So I, I was wondering about your methodology. I wondered if you could tell us more about the methodology that you follow in, um, in analyzing silence. Like, obviously, I understand that you say it is a question and does to do with meaning, but you know, how do we, how can, how can we talk anthropologically about silence mm -hmm. by also taking into account that there are different sort of kind of questions posed mm -hmm. uh, to it and to the different mm -hmm. kinds of communication. So I was just curious about that. Mm -hmm. Oui, c'est une question difficile. Je, euh, comment dire euh, le, le, La notion de silence est une direction, simplement, une direction de recherche. Well, the notion of silence is simply a direction, a kind of direction of research, a research trajectory. Et bien entendu, mon travail s'enracine quand même dans les mondes contemporains. So, um, Le Breton's work is grounded in, or kind of, um, yeah, responds to contemporary concerns um, and relates to the contemporary world. Voilà. Et à partir de là, donc, j'élargis mon propos dans une perspective phénoménologique, comme Domenico l'a dit. Uh, so, from a kind of phenomenological perspective, as Domenico put it. Um, voilà. Et à partir de là, euh, j'élargis mon propos à la littérature, au cinéma, à l'ethnologie, aux, aux différents systèmes religieux, aux systèmes politiques, etc. Et j'essaie de comprendre euh, donc, euh, les, les, modèles, les, les déclinaisons innombrables de, du silence, entre guillemets, toujours entre guillemets. 
So this phenomenological analysis extends to other concerns and other spheres like religion, um, literature, cinema, um, and um, this is kind of silence in quotation marks. Oui. Alors, j'utilise d'ailleurs, vous l'avez vu, énormément la littérature et le cinéma dans, 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 mon, dans mon travail de recherche. Là, j'ai cité, je n'ai pas cité, si j'ai cité Rudolf Otto, qui est l'un des grands historiens des religions, mais j'ai aussi cité des écrivains comme Nikos Kazantzaki, comme Edouard Abey, comme Jean Grenier. So, um, as you'll have noticed, um, in, the, in Le Breton's presentation, there were allusions to scholars like uh, Rudolf Otto, who's a historian of religion, as well as writers like Kazantzakis, and then the philosopher Grenier, and there was someone else. Edward Abbey, an écrivain American. And an American author, um, Edward Ab Abbey, is it? Abbey, Abbey. L'un des fondateurs de l'écologie aux États-Unis, quand même. One of the founders of ecology. Un très, très grand écrivain américain. Famous American author. Yes. Euh, oui, c'est-à-dire qu'un écrivain ou un cinéaste, par exemple un film indien, un, un écrivain bolivien ou, ou japonais, va nous parler du silence dans, dans des termes très spécifiques. OK, so different um, authors from in different contexts. So, for example, a Japanese writer will talk about silence in very specific terms, in specific contexts. Et mon travail d'anthropologue, c'est d'une certaine manière de réunir tous ces, toutes, ces, toutes ces déclinaisons, toutes ces, toutes ces traductions, entre guillemets, du silence. And so Le Breton's work is to kind of gather these different um, versions or variations um, of silence. Um, And the last last follow-up question and then I'll just leave the floor to Bernardo who has a question is how how does the difference uh, what is the role of the difference in this work of reuniting different oh. you know, oh, yeah. it's also something that concerns yeah. anthropologists yeah. You know, historically the difference mm -hmm. between cultures rather than what they have in common so what how what, what is the role of that in your approach uh, le, le travail le travail de l'anthropologie c'est à la fois de, de chercher quelles sont les différences et les similitudes qui existent dans la condition humaine et là dans un travail comme celui que j'ai mené sur le silence je, je laisse Léa traduire parce que okay so what, obviously what concerns the anthropologist is not just the question of um, similarity, but also difference um, as regards the human condition. Et, par, et donc, dans, par exemple, dans, dans mon livre, il y a un chapitre sur le silence dans la parole, hein, dans, la, dans la conversation. Euh, il, y a un, il y a un chapitre aussi sur le silence en politique, c'est-à-dire quand on est réduit au silence. Il y a un chapitre aussi sur le silence dans la psychothérapie, dans la psychanalyse. Euh, il y a un chapitre sur le religieux, j'en ai repris un petit peu la, les éléments dans mon exposé. Euh... Ok, so in his book, there's a chapter on silence in the context of speech, um, in the context of politics, so when people are silenced, um, silence in the context of psychotherapy um, or psychoanalysis, and also silence in the context of religion. So all these different aspects are um, broached in his book. Alors, par exemple, dans, dans la question de, de la conversation, euh, le silence, c'est plutôt la pause, en, en, la, la, le, le rythme de, de la parole. So, when you're talking about um, silence in the context of conversation, um, what's at issue is pausing. Um, so, the act of taking a kind of pausing in speech and also the rhythm um, of speech. Voilà. Et par exemple, par exemple, il y a des sociétés où l'on parle sans arrêt, où l'on parle tout le temps, où le moindre silence serait extrêmement inquiétant. Mais il y a d'autres sociétés humaines où l'on se tait énormément. OK, so there are societies where speech um, kind of is always continuous in conversation um, and not speaking is considered quite worrying um, or, or, yeah, kind of... Um, creates a kind of preoccupation or creates some sort of worry. Um, whereas there are other societies where um, people are quiet quite a lot. Et par, par exemple, des, des, des malentendus qu'ont qu observé des, des, des ethno-linguistes américains euh, concernent par exemple les interactions entre des populations amérindiennes et des Américains euh, ordinaires. 
Okay, so one example is um, the kind of misunderstanding that arises between um, Native Americans and kind of, um, I suppose, Caucasian Americans or non-Native Americans um, because of this kind of issue of silence, I suppose. Par exemple, si un Américain ordinaire pose une question à un Apache, euh, l'Apache va mettre très, 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 très longtemps avant de répondre. Mais c'est sa, sa manière culturelle d'échange, de, de prendre la parole. So, in one such interaction between um, an American and an Apachean, I don't know how to translate. Apache, un, un, un Apache, un Amérindien. Yeah, so a Native American. Um, there were a lot of pauses um, on the part of the um, Native American. And this is a kind of cultural way of expressing oneself that's specific to that, um, to that context. Et, et pour prendre un autre exemple plus banal, entre l'Europe du Nord et l'Europe méditerranéenne, par exemple, les, les, comment dire, le, le statut du silence dans la parole est fondamentalement différent. So to take a more kind of mundane example or more common example, more familiar, um, in the North, in Northern Europe, um, the role of silence is very different to that of Southern Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, si vous regardez les films de, Ber de, de Bergman, par exemple, le, il y a énormément de silence dans les interactions entre les personnages. So take the example of Bergman's movies, there are a lot of silences that arise between um, the different characters. Voilà, donc là, là, on serait dans une approche phénoménologique où, qui, qui montre à la fois des différences et des, et des, et des similitudes. So this is a case of using a phenomenological approach that kind of gestures at both similarities and differences. Right, yeah, I didn't want to have the attention too long. And we've got a question from uh, Bernardo. So Bernardo, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. It was great um, to, to have uh, a different perspective from the modern world since we mostly deal with, with ancient and dead cultures. So um, uh, it is really hard for us to make them speech, uh, speak. So, um, and uh, I'm glad that Omenico brought up this issue of the, of the phenomenological approach going back in part to uh, Otto, um, whose book uh, I have been reading a bit, it is a bit hard for me, but, uh, and um, because I know that it has been used a lot uh, in, in explaining the, the um, religiosity of uh, ancient cultures, such as uh, in the ancient Near East, so in, in Babylonia, mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed that that in the in the in this standard narrative about the evolution of ancient Near Eastern religion, there is a moment in 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 their view in which uh, people began to have a, a an individual a personal relationship with gods. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of, of having a, a more rather collective one, oui. mm -hmm. right? And uh, I, I noticed, of course, that, that all of your examples and uh, all of your discourse about religion in this talk was about the uh, individual, in fact. So the, the, the man alone in the in the mountain mm -hmm. or indeed a monk uh, mm -hmm. and in his relation with the, with the, with the teacher. But have you um, explored um, the, this role of uh, silence in religion uh, as a collective mm -hmm. phenomenon, as it were? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be um, relevant, I think, to a lot of us who work on the, on, the, on the ancient world, because what we can see 
most often is the is the collective religious uh, mm -hmm. rites, rather th than the, the the prayer or the mystic mm -hmm. of the individual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oui, merci beaucoup, Bernardo. Euh, écoutez, moi j'ai plutôt travaillé euh, au Brésil ou dans, par exemple dans, les, dans, les, dans, des, dans le Candomblé, dans l'Umbanda. Là, on a affaire à des cérémonies collectives. Je laisse Léa traduire. Est-ce que vous voulez bien répéter euh, dans quel contexte exactement euh, Au Brésil, euh, le, le, le Candomblé, l'Umbanda par exemple, qui sont des cérémonies euh, collectives. So there, um... Instances in Brazil, in, for example, in the Lumbanda um, context, ce sont des tribus, des... Non, des... non, ce sont des, des cérémonies. Des cérémonies. Uh, so these are specific ceremonies, um, such as the Lumbanda ceremony, um, where we have clearly collective um, ceremonies. Uh, qui sont, on pourrait dire d'ailleurs, polythéistes, entre guillemets. So we might say that these are actually polytheistic um, ceremonies. Et dans ces cérémonies, il n'y a aucune place pour le silence. Aucune and place pour le silence. In such ceremonies, there's no place at all for silence. On chante, on, on, loue, on loue les différents dieux, on danse. So there's chanting, um, dancing, and praise um, kind of directed at the gods. Il y a une forme de, une forme de dissolution relative de l'individualité. So there's a kind of relative dissolution of the individual. Or a kind of dissolution of individuality. Voilà. D'ailleurs, un certain nombre des, des fidèles sont souvent possédés par les dieux, par les saints. Okay, so there are cases where um, believers are kind of possessed by um, the saints. Les saints, vous avez dit les, Ou les saints, enfin oui. les dieux, c'est pas, pas. By the gods or saints. Donc voilà, le, le silence en effet renvoie davantage à des formes d'individualisation du, du rapport à Dieu. Ou, du rapport à Dieu. Je crois d'ailleurs que le, le silence est plus lié au monothéisme qu'au polythéisme. Oui. So silence um, is more specifically about, or it tends to relate primarily to um, a sense of um, individualization with regards to God. Um, so silence really has to do with this kind of more individualist um, kind of um, donc c'est un rapport individuel uh, <laughs> it essentially has to do with um, on the individual scale it doesn't relate to collective ceremonies um, mm -hmm. um, and it's also about monotheism as opposed to polytheism mm -hmm. oui. oui, dans les spiritualités orientales il n'y a pas de dieu véritablement So in um, kind of oriental spiritualities, um, there tends not to be um, a kind of engagement with gods, or right. God in the singular. God or God. Yeah. Okay. Although uh, if I can add uh, something, of course, uh, silence does play a good, um, an important part in the in the um, in ancient Greece. Oui. When it comes to the Eleusinian mysteries, of course, and well, but but that's where we don't have many sources oui. about. Mm -hmm. But we do know that that there were uh, rites in which silence uh, was the, a crucial part of the initiation process. But in fact. I think you may be right because the 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 initiation was a matter for, for, for the individual. Um, so, but we are still in a in a polytheistic context rather than than monotheistic, although it is true that it is a, a, a matter of the individual, as you say. So thank, you. thank you. Right, so any other questions or follow-ups? Okay, Hilaria has a question, so Hilaria, go ahead. Thank you so very much, Professor. And I wanted to ask you if you have broached the subject of the origins of the, the concept of silent prayer in different ancient religious tradition, because 
do you consider it to be a more, so to say, intellectual, um, intellectual sort of prayer as opposed to vocal prayer? From the anthropological point of view, it's not uh, really a commonplace consideration for the cognitive process that it implies. Anthropomorphic gods can hear prayers with their ears. And so if the prayer is inaudible, it may cause some problems. So have you broached this subject? I'm particularly interested in the Near Eastern societies, uh, Near Eastern religions. But again, if you have a broader perspective, thank you. Donc, la question, euh, c'est donc, euh, quelles sont les origines du concept du silence dans le contexte des religions anciennes Si vous êtes intéressé à ces questions, tout d'abord. Inner prayer, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, prayers, did you say inner, inner prayer, silent prayer. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Sorry. Prayer of the art. Mm -hmm. uh, donc, les, les prières internes. Inner, pra inner prayers, did you say yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, And, et, et aussi, si vous pensez qu'il s'agit plutôt d'une dimension intellectuelle ou uh, vocale, vocal, did you say? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if it's something more of an intellectual construction as opposed to vocal prayers, because gods are anthropomorphic and they can hear prayers and speak, but what about the prayer of the mind? Okay. Mm -hmm. Donc, voilà. Oui, non, je, je crois que j'ai compris. Oui, euh, bon, je, je crois d'abord qu'il ne faut pas opposer évidemment euh, l'adresse la, à Dieu en termes silencieux ou en termes en termes oral. So we, we don't have, on ne doit pas opposer euh, ces, ces deux. On ne doit pas opposer ces deux formes de prière silencieuse. Il me semble que la prière intérieure est davantage une adresse intime à Dieu. So an inner prayer is more of an intimate kind of address to God. Alors que l'adresse la, la, orale, évidemment à la fois elle vise Dieu, mais elle vise aussi la communauté des croyants. Whereas an oral prayer, um, of course, targets God, but, or is directed at God, but also addresses itself to the community of believers. Une communauté d'ailleurs qui peut être présente ou absente. And this community may or may not be present. Je, je peux très bien imaginer une prière, euh, la prière d'un moine solitaire euh, dans le désert euh, qui, qui parle. So one, might, one might imagine a monk um, who's kind of speaking aloud alone in the desert. Mais en même temps, il a, il a toute une tradition euh, religieuse qui l'accompagne. But at the same time, there is a whole lot of kind of religious background or baggage that accompanies him. Je crois d'ailleurs que sa parole est très synonyme du silence. And that sort of speech there is very closely related to silence, or is almost synonymous with silence. De la même façon que son silence est très synonyme d'une parole. Uh, in the same way that silence is synonymous with speech. All right, we've got if. Hilaria doesn't have any follow-up. We've got. Merci beaucoup, professeur. Merci beaucoup, Hilaria. We've got a new question uh, from Professor Efrat Michel. Uh, go on. Go ahead. Sorry. Thanks. Um, thanks for your talk. I just wondered, short question: How do you identify silence, and does silence has have to take time? Does it consume time? That's a question. Je n'ai pas très bien compris. Léa Alors, euh, comment est-ce qu'on identifie le silence et est-ce que le silence prend du temps ah. euh, Est-ce qu'il occupe euh, une durée euh, Est-ce qu'il prend du ah. temps Voilà. C'est une question, oui. Merci. C est, c est, la, le silence, c'est du sens, toujours. Donc... Euh, euh, à, la, à la fois il prend du temps et je ne sais pas c'est une question extrêmement difficile j'ai du mal à y répondre this is a very difficult question um, so silence is meaning it does take time in, in that sense but it's a very difficult um, thing to answer on peut, être, on peut être silencieux devant une personne qui meurt par exemple devant une personne très très malade So we might be silent before someone who's very ill or who's dying. Mm 
Et en même temps, mais c'est un silence qui est plein de présence, qui est plein, qui est plein de signification, qui est plein d'amour peut-être aussi. But it's a kind of silence that's full of um, meaning, um, that might be full of love. Et, et de présence aussi. And of presence, it's full of presence as well. Et, et, et dans ce cas-là, par exemple, ce silence ne prend pas de temps. And in that case, um, that sort of silence doesn't actually take up time. Il est le temps même. Il, il incarne le temps. Oh, it, it actually um, embodies time itself. Et il y a d'autres moments où effectivement le silence peut nous paraître une perte de temps. And there are other instances where silence might seem like a waste of time. Par exemple, par exemple dans la conversation dans nos sociétés. For instance, in the context of conversations in our societies. Ou quand on, a, quand on parle à quelqu'un, on, on attend qu'il nous réponde immédiatement, qu'il ne prenne pas quelques minutes avant de nous répondre. Or when we're speaking to people and we um, don't expect them to take up time to respond, we want them to respond immediately. Oui, donc, donc le, le, le silence, comment dire, le statut et la signification du silence renvoient toujours à une situation précise. So the status and kind of um, meaning, signification of um, silence always relates to a specific situation. Voilà. Et, et une situation donc qui est à la fois sociale, culturelle. Which is both social and cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, please join me in thanking him for a very interesting talk and in thanking also very much Lea Cantor for her uh, very precious help with translating. Um, so, um, Uh, it's very nice to it was very nice to have you here. Thank you very much for attending the seminar, both the initial part and again thanks to Professor Efrat who is here and to Professor Le Breton. Um, I guess that concludes uh, our term, you know, the events of our term on silence. Uh, we circulate the new um, call for speakers for our uh, events next term. Our reading group will focus on um, orality, so please uh, check it out, have a look, and just let us know if you're interested. We'll get back in touch very soon, and thank you very much again. I wish you all the best for the uh, holidays and new year, and uh, yeah, so thanks again to all of you. Merci beaucoup, Dominico. Merci, Léa. Merci, uh, Flaminia. Merci à vous. Thank you. Merci.